Um, I'm very happy to be here today. This is the kind of work that I think is really important, um, and it's the exact kind of crowd that I would be liking to, that I would want to give this kind of presentation to. So I feel quite privileged to be able to do that. So um, today, well, this presentation is looking at the roots of this position in the 19th century. Um, this is just an overview. We're going to start by um, looking at what exactly do we mean by dispossession in the context of the 19th century. Um, then look at what are the different ways that Africans were dispossessed. Um, and then I'll go into the phases of dispossession. So that will be sort of not quite chronological, but, um, but you know, just looking at different, different steps in this, this process of, of um, what we have today. Uh, and then um, this will include looking at um, the recognition of property law in South Africa um, and the failure to recognize indigenous land rights in the beginning, um, misunderstanding and codifying customary land tenure, the creation of trusts and locations, and finally questions around African land purchase. And then the final thing that we'll look at is uh, the impact of the mineral revolution on these processes. Although we'll also discuss this a little bit before as well, where, where it becomes relevant. So the geographical focus um, you know, of this lecture is going to be um, primarily Cape Colony, Natal, and the Transvaal. Um, most of my experience is, is what to do with the old, the former Transvaal. Uh, when I, I did my PhD on South Africa's land reform and historical perspectives, and I looked at um, you know, the particular district of Limpopo. Uh, but I kind of got a sense of, of the sort of Transvaal um, uh, area. Uh, so if I tend to use examples more from the Transvaal than other places, then that's really why. Um, one of the important things to remember when looking at 19th century South Africa is that the South Africa that we know today didn't exist then. There were separate colonies and states. Um, so we're looking at the Cape Colony, which was, after 1806, ruled by the, Bit the British. Natal also became a British colony. The Transvaal was a separate Boer independent republic, as was the Orange Free State. And so when we're looking at these different places, what you always have to realize is when talking about 19th century South Africa, it's difficult to generalize too much and say, well, there was this law in the Cape Colony, and that affected land rights across the country. It didn't, because at this point in time, you still have different things happening in, e in different places, different governments ruling different places. So, you know, the, the, let's do the first, first question first. What do we mean by dispossession? Now, you know, obviously one of the, one of the key things that, that we think about when dispossession is imagining the 20th century, the forced removals of the 20th century, where people were forcefully removed from their land, often at gunpoint, often violently, um, you know, belongings um, taken away. But um, I think another really important aspect of this position, I think, which you have to separate from the idea of physically being removed from land, is um, losing rights to land, actual rights. Um, and this is, you know, this is, I think, one of the most important kind of key issues, key points that I want to get across in this presentation, is that while large-scale dispossession, actually being removed off the land, occurred in the 20th century, it was in the 19th century that profound loss of rights to land took place. So most dispossession, if you think about loss of rights to land, happened long before the 1913 Land Act. It happened in the 19th century. And, you know, this also has an impact on how um, on how early people experience actual removal from their land. And this is also about the geographical difference um, across the country. So, you know, for example, people in um, the coarser territories, they might have experienced forced removal, being literally having their land taken away from them, being forced to move off their land, as early as 1812, um, during the Fourth Frontier War between the British and, the, um, and some coarser groups and Kusan groups. Um, you know, what happened there was then, after the war, the British forced people to move beyond the Fish River. Some people stayed behind, but generally people were, a lot of people actually did have to move. On the other hand, you'll have other parts of South Africa where people had no rights to land anymore after the 19th century, but 
they managed to stay on the land and stay living on the land for generations um, until they were perhaps removed in the 1960s, even as late as the 1960s. This is just to illustrate that point, um, which is, you know, that people could be living on land for a long time after the land was, you know, they lost rights to it. So this is um, just the table that I used in my um, in my my PhD, and you can see here the, the sort of this settlement pattern. So um, you know, on in defined locations um, in Hennetsburg area, you have 4,604 people. On government farms and other lands, you have 17,000 people. On private farms, that is on farms that are owned by whites or by landowning companies, you have 18,000. So you can see how, you know, and this, and this kind of continued, in fact, even got increased um, over time, was that more and more people were on private farms. And so you've got to recognize there that, you know, rights losing, rights and losing. Okay, so what are the different ways that dispossession occurred before 1913? Um, there are a number of different ways, um, and it's, it's helpful to kind of, um, you know, look at them distinctly as different types of processes because it helps to avoid some confusion. Um, so the first one, which is most obvious and happens, you know, kind of this is the, the night that the 1800s is really when this happens the most, is conquer, right? So that's when you know the, the colonists, the British colonists, or the Boers, force African kingdoms and chiefdoms. And you know, having won that, force uh, chiefs and kings to cede land to them. So to cede land means to basically sign us away. Um, it's saying, you know, we no longer have authority over this land; it now belongs to you. So that was, you know, one aspect of of this possession was was you know losing these wars of conquest. The next um, very important thing is uh, is dishonest treaty. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of that phrase, the pen is mightier than the sword. And in this case, you know, and I don't know if you've, if you've read it also before, is that more land was lost you know, through signing treaties and signing papers and laws than through conquer. So conquer really, it, it occurred really with the, with the major African kingdoms um, and, uh, you know, and, and kind of involved specific areas of land. Signing over treaties involves often far larger areas of land. And I'll go into some examples. Okay, well, first of all, um, why am I calling these treaties this one? Well, one of the things about, you know, the 1800s is that, you know, you'd have the Boers and the British coming with pieces of paper um, for chiefs to sign, and they'd say, look, this is what we, this is what we want from you. Um, we're coming here to settle um, we would really like to have a piece of paper that gives us um, rights to settle here. We want to have some kind of security. And, you know, chiefs might, you know, they might discuss it, and then chiefs sign a piece of paper. But what they discussed with the Boers or the British was not what's on the paper. So, you know, you have a lot of situations where people are signing things, except they're not fully aware of the content of those documents. Another way that this happens is, you know, there's a sort of a very important element of kind of mis I'm not sure if it's miscommunication, just a kind of a misunderstanding that the Boers had and, and, and perhaps ex and how they exploited it um, of, you know, sort of customary land tenure. So what would often happen is, say, a Boer or, a, you know, a leader would come to a chief and say, we, you know, we'd like to settle him. Now, for a chief, this isn't anything unusual. There's nothing unusual about a group of people from outside coming into an area which you have some kind of control over and saying, you know, please can we settle here and please can we have secure rights? Let's not fight. We don't want to have a war. We want to be here peacefully. Um, you know, we don't want to have our cattle taken from us and we won't take other people's cattle. There is nothing at all unusual about it. What was different with the Boers and which a lot of African chiefs did not yet understand say, in the Transvaal when they were signing these papers, was that once they had these pieces of paper, the Boers would say, okay, now this land belongs to us, we own it. And so it was imposing a completely new type of understanding of property and ownership on, you know, what was essentially a, a kind of age-old way of, of um, you know, moving to a new place and having secure rights to a place. So that's the other way, you know, that, that's the other thing I'm thinking of when I'm talking about dishonest treaties. 
And then another, which is a, you know, there are sort of also classic examples of, you know, for example, the, 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 um, there was a treaty that Dingaan was supposed to have signed, which basically gave the Boers all of Zululand, or a very large chunk of it. Now, they found this treaty, this supposed signed piece of paper, in a leather pouch um, at the side of, of um, gosh, who was it? I think it was Kitty. Who's the chief? Um, who was killed by the Zulu. They found it a month after the attack. So, I mean, the point that Peter made, I, 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 I sort of tracked him, he said, you know, what would normally happen in a situation like this is that scavengers would see a leather bag and eat it up and take it away. But somehow this piece of paper still remains. And another classic example is what happened with the Swazi in the Transvaal. So I don't know if you know the story, but what happened in 1846 was the Swazi met with the Swazi and they signed away, they ceded a huge chunk of territory in the Transvaal. And they said, you know, well, fine, this is, this is your land, you can have it now. The problem was, the Swazi did not have control. They didn't have, have the right to do that. They didn't own the land. Um, in fact, they even ceded land as far um, west as the, as the Pedi Kingdom. So the Pedi King, you can imagine, was not very impressed with this. And neither were all of the smaller groups, the in independent groups, um, sometimes as, you know, as, as big as you know, a, a couple of homesteads together, but who nevertheless had independent access to the land. They had been hiding from the Swazi, um, avoiding the Swazi, fighting them throughout all this period. They, they weren't under the, under the control of the Swazi. So the Swazi might have imagined that they could do this. But really, they couldn't. They didn't have the right. So that's another sort of critical. And in the Transvaal, that was a really, really critical moment um, of, of the sort of loss, of loss of land. All right, and then, you know, the key, the, the next thing is, is this. Um, imposition of Roman Dutch property law, and which happened at the same time as failing to recognize the rights, land rights of indigenous people, um, and also imposing a problematic interpretation of custom law. So there are different aspects to this, and, and this is something that I'm going to spend a bit more time on um, in the next couple of slides. But um, there are three sorts of important things uh, that happen here. The first is, you know, just obviously the legal failure to recognize it. In, in that sense, ignoring a kind of uh, certain right. The next is, is imposing customary law, which also, again, fails to recognize individual rights. Um, but then the next really critical thing was surveying the land into farms. Um, and this is very important because once you've surveyed land into farms, then the government was able to say to Boers or to, or to white settlers or to burghers or you know all of the different types of, of set white settlers, um, this is your farm. You now own this farm. And then once that happened, you had things like the imposition of a system of labor tenancy. So, um, and I'm going to spend a bit of time on this. So I think a useful thing is just to try to imagine what the, nine, what the 1800s were like, what it was like, say, in 1860. And if you were a Boer settler and you arrived in this land and you wanted to, you wanted to start making money, right? You wanted to start um, uh, basically building up some kind of commercial enterprise. So what do you do? I mean, what, what was the place like in that period, right? If you think of the, ro the route between Cape Town and Polokwane, there wasn't an N1 at that stage. Right? There wasn't a, there wasn't an N3 to Durban. There weren't like these major roads, transit routes, all that kind of thing. How were they going to get those things? Well, they needed labor. Okay, so you need labor to build roads, to build railway lines. How are you going to carry all of your goods, all of these things that you want to trade with? Say ivory. Okay, firstly, how are you going to get the ivory in the first place? You need people, to, you need um, local guides to help you to find the elephants and then to shoot the elephants and then to carry the tusks. You need people to carry like large packets of things um, to guide the, the oxen and the horses and the donkeys. You need people to do so many different tasks. And like you didn't have machines like today, no cars. So really, you know, this was a very, um, Boers were desperate for labor. Even within the household, even basic household chores, um, required help. You, people had to make their own soap. 
So within a Boer household, you might have a, a, you know, a, a, a wife and a daughter um, of the of the of the Boer can say, well, we're going to make soap now. <laughs> we're going to make candles. We're going to do these kinds of things. Um, but who's going to tend the fields? You know, who's going to who's going to pull out weeds in the in the um, uh, fields of maize? Um, and there was a kind of a religiously based view um, amongst in Boer society at the time that white women and children could not work. They should not labor. And there was an also you know, this kind of white supremacist understanding, which is that Boers are at a higher rung, and so they can rule, but you know, they need African people to labor. So this was a sort of this basic assumption and basic understanding, and what underlay the labor tenancy system. Because then what was happening is that you know, Boers were not trying to find land far away from African groups. They didn't want empty land. They wanted to engage with local communities so that they could work out relationships with, you know, getting labor. Um, and so this is why, you know, when land was surveyed into farms, boys would often find a farm which had already a, a, a kind of homestead or a small community living there already. And then they could say, well, this is our land. We're the owners of this land. And, you know, if you want to stay here, you know, we are the new chiefs. That's the other thing that they would say, is that we are the new chiefs. If you want to stay here, then you have to do this for us. Um, and, you know, of course, this is a, also a, often a very violent process. So what was tricky is that a lot of people weren't actually able to, it was very difficult sometimes for people to resist, for a kind of local groups to resist. They could leave, but the 19th century, the 1800s, were a very dangerous time in general. It was a very difficult time. There was fighting all over the place, and so people tended to try to be around people who might, in some ways, protect them from others, using guns and things like that. So, so the surveying of land into farms and the imposing a system of labor tenancy is really the kind of end point um, of, of dispossession in this area. OK, so we'll go into the phases of dispossession. So when the British um, when the British first arrived in the Cape Colony in 1806, they recognised the private property of settlers under Roman Dutch law, but they failed. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, but they failed to. Can this is better? Okay. So they recognised um, the private property of settlers under Roman Dutch law, um, and they and at the same time they failed to recognise. Um, indigenous land rights, strong indigenous land rights, because of course eventually they did recognize individual tenure, but um, I mean customary tenure, but in a particular way. Um, and the British really, you know, from this point on, from sort of 1806 on, um, sort of basically where it, ha it was a kind of occurring theme um, that they. Sorry, I'm in my slide, was a re recurring theme that they would generally take the side of white settlers in just about all land disputes. So from the beginning, from 1806, onto you know a, an example I'm going to give now. So a sort of famous example, um, one of the biggest betrayals of the British, and it was one of many, um, was after the South African War of 1899 to 1902. This was fought in the Transvaal. It was a kind of rebellion of the Boers against the, the British rule. And they were quite strong. And in this case, what happened was that a lot of African societies were obviously fed up with Boer rule. Um, the Boers were taking away land from people. They were imposing, in some places, systems of labor tenancy, um, especially in, in kind of the more populated places. And so a lot of African communities fought against the Boers with the British. They became allies. They risked their lives in order to help the British. At the end of the war, um, and this is why I have this picture here, um, signing the Peace Treaty of Vereniging in 1902. Do you see a black face in there? No. Because at the end of the war, the treaty was signed between the British and the Boers, and they basically allowed the Boers to go back to the farms which they had um, had to leave during the, 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 the period of the war. 
And what had happened was, you know, often boys had to leave for whatever reason. They went into hiding. They were moving because they were fighting. Um, women and children were taken um, to concentration camps. And a lot of African communities who'd been kicked off some of those farms then went and inhabited them again. And at the end of the war, what the British did was they said, no, you've got to leave. You know, this is private property. The Boers own this land. So, you know, they recognize this is a kind of classic example of recognizing the rights of the settlers, um, private property rights, um, as opposed to, you know, the kind of rights of, of the African communities that came before that. So the British had a very bad reputation in this. But actually the British, in some ways, could be considered slightly better than the Boers. Mostly, and I'm only saying this, in terms of recognizing any kind of right to land, right? So um, the Boers had a resolution, they, they passed the resolution, uh, the Transvaal Boers, in 1953, saying no one who is not a recognized burger shall have any right to possess movable property in freehold. Okay, burger is citizen. And of course, naturally, no black or colored person could be considered a citizen. Yes, 1853, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I meant 1853. Um, that, that no one could become... Oh, yeah, sorry. I, it's, this is a yeah, it's typo that I make every single time. Every single time. Okay, maybe you can just cross out 1953 and put there 1853. <laughs> yeah. um, so, of course, black or colored people could not be considered citizens. So um, it's worth now going into this question. So I've been saying that the British and the Boers didn't recognize um, indi um, in indigenous land rights. But I mean, I suppose maybe in some ways that's a bit too strong um, a, a kind of way of putting it, right? Because you know they did, in, they did acknowledge some kind of right. But the problem was the type of way that they understood indigenous land rights was very problematic. And so now we're going to look at that. So the description, interpretation, and eventual codification of systems of land tenure in African communities within the British Empire, across the whole of the British Empire, um, was very influenced by social Darwinism. So what is social Darwinism? Social Darwinism is an idea that there are that societies are on different kind of rungs of a ladder of evolution. So some people are more evolved than other people. Except the way that the British understood it, and Europe, uh, some white Europeans understood it at the time, was that this is a kind of racial thing. So you could say that some races were more advanced than others. And what they did was they sort of, they obviously saw themselves as the pinnacle of advancement in civilization, and they saw Africans as less advanced than they were. And what they believed was that private property um, was a kind of a mark of civilization. So, you know, and, and, and people with less evolved uh, societies had weak communal rights. And the way that they understood these communal rights was also that these were rights to use the land, the surface of the land. So they're called technically usufruct rights, um, which literally means use of the fruit. It's Latin. Um, and so when you think about it, about the kind of rights that they were, that, that people imagined um, African societies to have, was that you know they could they could farm the land, they could cut down trees, they could do all these other things, but you know the land itself did not belong to them. So you know the other thing that the other in, uh, thing that influenced the codifying of, of customary land tenure was the uh, what's it called the Cape Native Laws Commission, uh, which happened in uh, 1883. Okay, so the Cape Native Laws Commission in 1883. So how did they, how did the British try to figure out, you know, what these customary land tenure, what, what, how, how, what it meant, how, it, you know, um, what its characteristics were? Well, they took evidence from missionaries, the white missionaries. They took evidence from senior colonial officials, and they took evidence from chiefs. So you've got a question here. Well, is this maybe not a bit biased? Do we maybe not have a group of people who are going to give us quite a one-sided view of what customary land tenure is? Um, and here you have a quote from 
Theophila Shepstone, um, who was a very senior um, colonial official in Natal. Um, and he said, the land belongs to the tribe. The chief has the right of giving occupation to it as between members of the tribe. Land is, however, always spoken of as the property of the chief. Okay, and these, as I say, and, and I'll repeat, um, this kind of emphasizes the distinction between strong land rights under common law, the sort of Roman Dutch property law, and, um, and weak communal land rights. So this is what the Native Laws Commission um, concluded. The land occupied by a tribe is regarded theoretically as the property of the paramount chief. In relation to the tribe, he is trustee, holding it for the people who occupy and use it in, a subord in subordination to him on communistic principles. All right, I'm sure you're all wondering why I have a picture of um, King Goodwill's at Guelantini here. So this, this point, this quote, um, is really central in understanding what is going wrong with land restitution today. And you see it, I see it a lot in Limpopo, where I do a lot of work, um, and I'm sure you see it all over the place in, in you know, the recent um, land claims of the Zulu King for a very large part of the country. Um, is this idea that, you know, in the, in, you know, before the 19, before the, the, the 1900s, so during the 1800s, in pre-colonial times, chiefs owned the land. And so a territory, a kind of political area of authority, is the same thing as actually having ownership rights. But it only belongs to one person. It only belongs to the chief or the ruling family. And so you see in a lot of land claims, um, sort of chiefs or, uh, you know, either very recognized chiefs or not or chiefs that, you know, have been forgotten about in the last hundred years, saying, you know, this used to be our land. We as chiefs own it. And so you have these huge claims. Um, you know, and I think the other point about how what's happening in the 19th century is relevant to what's happening today is that, you know, in the trans, is, is the point that people lost rights to land in the 19th century, in the 1800s. Um, and so, you know, when people, and, and people kind of could continue to live on that land in the 20th century. So the loss of rights was experienced in the 1800s. And so that's what people are referring to when they make these large claims. And that's why they can say, you know, we were chiefs then and we owned the land. So, you know, there are just, to reiterate, there's this pervasive notion that rights to land flowed downward um, in African land tenure systems and were derived from the political authority and political allegiance. Okay, so there's mixing up of a political belonging and ownership. Um, even so, even so, uh, the British still did not even fully recognize chief ownership over land. Um, so when, you know, so when the British would give locations or reserves, they would say, okay, well, they have use of such rights. The chief owns this land, but can only, you know, we're the trustees ultimately. So, you know, he doesn't even have full rights to land. So what are the consequences of this imaginary, we call it imaginary of custom, because it's how people imagined custom to be. So in a way, you know, it, that became real, that became a kind of real thing, um, was this, this, this version of custom. So what did it do? Well, I mean, I think the most critical thing, especially, um, you know, in the sort of uh, work I think that, uh, I mean, I, I think I heard that you do, is that it, it undermined what in reality was very strong rights to land held at the household and even personal level. Um, so um, Kerr, who I've, I've put a kind of reading from, from him at the bottom of the, of the, the paper of the uh, slide, um, argued that individuals, that the rights, the individual's rights to land were exclusive, enforceable, and inheritable, and amounted to ownership rather than mere use of rights over land. Um, so I've heard that you know this is a controversial, um, or not controversial, but um, debatable version of what you know in, uh, customary tenure was, the individual rights that people had. Um, but you know I think it's you know it's definitely kind of somewhere on that spectrum of very strong rights at the household level. Um, another thing that, that I've argued in my in an, you know in in my in the research I've done is that a lot of people in uh, in parts of the country didn't even get their land, they didn't even need to get permission from a chief to settle on 
land, right? It was only in some places where there was a sort of very powerful chief that people would go and settle. But, you know, for parts of the 19th century and of the early 20th century, so the early 19th, 20, uh, early 1900s, people, you know, people could move away from a chief, get complete independence, and settle on land without needing that permission. Okay, so this idea that the chiefs are always in charge, you have to go through a, through a chief to get land. You know, that's not really the case in all parts of South Africa. It might be the case, you know, in the center of very important um, chieftaincies and kingdoms, but it's not a kind of general rule. It's not a general rule that in the 19th century, every single um, African who wanted to get land had to go and ask a chief for permission. That's nonsense. Um, so, you know, this kind of imagina imaginary of custom um, undermined um, the rights. It, it kind of, that led itself to a loss of rights of land that ordinary people may once have held. Especially because now it was written down, you know. Now it was, it was rigid, it was solid. You couldn't change that anymore. <coughs> the other thing about this kind of imagination of what customary tenure was like um, was that it supported the legitimacy of the various treaties that the Boers and British signed with the chief, um, right? Because basically, let's look at the logic. The logic is that you know the chief owns the land. The chief has political authority, and so he owns the land. Therefore, if we conquer, if we speak directly to the chief, and the chief signs a piece of paper saying that we can have the land, that's that we've got the land. Because the only person you need permission from is the chief, because the chief is the only owner, right? And also similarly with conquest. Um, when it came to the wars of conquest, which included, you know, the Corsa Wars and the um, Anglo-Zulu War and the Pedi War and the wars in Zunz and Dabeli, you know, they could then say, well, we've won. Um, so now we have political authority, and with political authority in an African land tenure system, we own the land now. And so that enabled them then also to kind of see themselves as paramount chiefs so for the British literally referred to themselves as paramount chiefs. Um, and then, you know, the, the, I think it was the, the um, Secretary of Native Affairs or the Superintendent of, of, of Natives would say, well, no, we are now the, we are now the rulers. And we control the land. Um, um, this picture here is the Battle of Blood River. Um, so that's one of the battles that led to a kind of negotiation around, around borders and boundaries between the Zulus and um, the Natal, uh, the Republic of Natalia, which was short-lived, it didn't last very long. All right, so <coughs> is this slide 13? Okay, yeah. So land was reserved for. Um, so the, the kind of consequences of this is that you know the British then. And, and uh, later on, the Boers were made to do this. Uh, they would reserve land um, for Africans and act as custodians. Um, now, the thing is, I've already mentioned the ZAR, the, the kind of state of the Trans Republic, the Transvaal Boers, didn't reserve land or locations for Africans. So they just simply divided the land up and said, okay, well, we can put owners in all of these different farms, and they, they own the land. So they didn't even give locations to chiefs. Um, except when the British, so there was a rebellion between the Boers and the British. What happened, I'll just go back a little bit. In 1877, um, seven years after diamonds were discovered in Kimberley, uh, the British started to look at the ZAR, the, the independent Boer Republic, and say, we'd actually, we'd like some of that. You know, we'd like to have access to those diamonds. Um, and they kind of made up these kind of excuses for why they should annex um, the ZAR and take control. So they took control of this c republic against the wishes of the Boers. So in 1889, the Boers rebelled and they said, we don't want this. So that was the first Anglo-Boer War. And then the British managed to keep control and in 1881, they signed a treaty. And what the British said was that the condition of signing this treaty was that land had to be set aside for African reserves. So that's a very, very important moment in the history of, of the kind of northern parts of the country in the Transvaal, um, it's a very important moment because it, it, it kind of sets the scene um, for what we, what we see in the 20th century, in the 1900s. And this process, you know, 
creating reserves in, say, the, you know, the, the Cape Colony and Natal, and in locations um, in the free, in the Transvaal. And this is why you say you hear about locations in the northern areas, in Limpopo, um, in Gauteng. You know, you always hear of rural locations, and then whereas in you know Natal and in um, the Cape Colony, well, former Cape Colony, you hear of reserves. It's because of this difference, right? Because you know reserves were created far further further back. Um, uh, kind of longer ago by the British in the British colonies. And then in, when they took over in the Transvaal, then they created locations. And we're going to get to the difference between these locations and the reserves. Um, but of course, then you have, so who is going to administer the land? And you have this, the creation of trust to administer the land. Um, and one example is, you know, looking at the Natal Native Trust, uh, which was created in 1864. Um, the Zululand Native Trust in 1909, and of course this is this is a sort of precursor um, to the Ingonyama Trust. Um, so, you know, I, there's a, there's a sort of reference there to an article uh, looking at the sort of establishment of of, um, of uh, divide and rule. Okay, so, and the point about reserves and locations, and the issue of trusteeship and all that, is that. Once again, people had use of rust only. They had the use of the fruit, but they did not have mineral rights. Okay, so all question of mineral rights, you know, it, it was not even addressed. It was, you know, quite simply, no, they have use of the land, but they do not own the land. It's not in freehold. They don't have freehold for use of the land. All right, this is a picture of the Kimberley Diamond Mine. Um, and I'm going to rewind a little bit now, because we have to understand how this kind of situation arose that these that there were these wars of conquest. You know, why was the Petty Kingdom attacked? Why was the Zulu Kingdom attacked? Um, we, what, what was going on here? Um, you know, and why also were locations in the Transvaal so small? Because they were. So this is this is where minerals become very very important. The British had no interest in the Transvaal. In fact, you know, the British Crown, the, the Metropole. Um, you know, in the UK, um, you know, far north of here, they, they didn't even like the Cape Colony or having Natal. It was actually quite a burden um, to the government to have these colonies, especially in the Cape Colony. The Cape Colony was a nightmare for the British in England um, because it was just these constant wars and expense and sending soldiers over. And, you know, really it was at the end of the day they were saying, well, what are the benefits of this? What are the benefits of this to us? The idea that they would then go into the Transvaal, which as we know, there was no N3 highway linking the places, it would involve a massive operation, um, lots of troops, um, lots of expenditure, lots of lives to send people to um, the Transvaal to take over. So what happened? Why did they? Why did they? And the obvious answer is because of the discovery of diamonds and minerals, because suddenly the place became payable. You know. Some, and some people within, you know, the sort of um, the uh, kind of colonial, um, the colonial officials who sort of had, they had a career as colonial officials. They had a career sort of, you know, basically ruling over other places and, and seeing themselves as quite grand, you know, and quite important people. And um, they were also very, very ambitious. And so they had this idea that they would create a, a confederation. They would bring together the different colonies they would take over the, the Boer Republic and expand even as far north as Rhodesia and create this confederation of South Africa. And what would they do then? Well, then they'd be able to build rail links, road links without any problem, without those hectic negotiations that take place between one country and another when you want to you know, create a road between them. Um, they could, they could uh, make use of the mines. They could get you know, the, the sort of diamonds um, easily transportable. There wouldn't be all these issues. And they'd also be able to kind of open up the place for, you know, more occupation and settlement and farming and things like that. But all of that would only come later, right? So it was diamonds that really got them thinking, okay, well now we can make this pay. This can this can be good for us. So what we often hear is that, you know, what people the reason why it was then important to take land away from Africans to dispossess them, um, physically, literally. Uh, was because they wanted to force 
Africans who at that stage were economically independent to become mine workers, okay, exploited mine workers. But it's a bit more complicated than that. So Kimberley did not have, there was not no labor shortage at Kimberley. Um, there was a stream of migrant labor coming particularly from Mozambique. Um, and the, the, so, you know, one of the problems that, 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 the, that the British had with the Zulu Kingdom was that the Zulu King didn't allow people to go out and work, right? Um, they weren't allowed to work in white industries, they weren't allowed to work on white farms, and they weren't allowed to work on the mines. There was a very tight system of control. Um, but the fact that they wouldn't allow um, kind of Zulu men to go and work in the mines, that didn't bother the colonial officials that much. What really bothered them was that the migrant laborers who were going to work on the mines were coming from Mozambique, and they had to cross over through Zululand to get to the mine. But on their way through Zululand, they often had to experience a bit of trouble. Sometimes they would be robbed, they would be waylaid, and they would be forced to kind of pay trip taxes or something. Sometimes there were you know, more serious conflicts, right? And sometimes people would even be killed. What the British wanted, and, the, and the, what the Transvaal was, was to be able to police the area. Not necessarily to force Zulu men to work in the mines, but to police the area so that people who were interested in working in the mine could get to them. But there's another thing, which is that taking labor to go to the mine was not a huge The mines paid relatively well compared to other African things. What they were struggling to do was to get people to work on the sugar plantations and on the poor farms. They would probably get people to work in cases of occupation where they would not be able to accumulate the type of wages and things that they could get um, in, in, in Kimberley. Um, so one of the things, you know, the different places of employment that a lot of African migrants preferred was to go to, say, a sheep farm or a cattle farm, where they would be given, where they would be paid in livestock. Okay, that was a good way of getting paid. Um, and then, you know, mine, you know, this, you know, going to Kimberley was not just working in the mine, it was also about meeting people who could sell you guns and horses, which were very, very important at this time. So there are reasons why people wanted to go, you know, to do this work. They did not want to get stuck on a on a poor farm, right? And they did not, not want to work in a sugar plantation. So it was trying to get a situation where they could force people to work in farms. That's really one of the most important things that kind of drives some of this um, some of the, you know, the wars of conflict and, and efforts to um, damage the economic um, independence of African groups. Okay, so, and so this is really at root of a lot of the conflict, you know, in this area generally. And this is why, you know, during the Location Commission of 1904, um, commissioners, the commissioners who were discussing, okay, there were two Location Commissions, right? One was in, 18, was, was in the late 1800s, in 1887, I think, some lo a lot of locations were granted. There was a second one after the Second, the, the second World War, or what we call the South African War, where more locations were granted, okay? So um, there were two, two of these processes, but both of them, you know, one of the critical issues, the sources of conflict between Boers and British were, well, you know, if you give fake locations, you know, it's going to be even harder for us to get you know, to get labor for our farms. So this is a kind of, this, this really sort of illustrates the point about the size of locations. Um, here you have, okay, this is a map, it's actually from 1935, uh, and it shows um, settlements. So each one of those dots represents 10 taxpayers or something like that. Um, here you can see, you know, those little square brackets which are very densely occupied, those are the locations. But do you see how irrelevant they are compared to actual patterns of settlement, right? This goes back to my point about, you know, people remaining on land, which they had no rights to um, for a very long period of time, even though dispossession had technically <coughs> taken place. This is in 1935, and another point that, I, that is important is that after, the 19, after 1900, after the um, South African War, a lot of people were actually dispersed a lot more, right? It became safer for people to move away from the, the chiefdoms and the kingdoms where they often congregated in times of danger. It was a kind of way of, of being secure, right? With living in smaller villages. 
after 1902, when there are fewer wars, uh, in fact, when the wars stop, then people are able to spread out a lot more. So that's why also another reason why you see this kind of settlement pattern, which is that people did not need to live near the chiefs anymore for protection. They could spread out a lot more. All right, so I'm going to very briefly go through this because, of course, what we know is that it wasn't that, you know, an important thing about, you know, the 20th century and building up to what the next presentation is going to be on the 1913 Land Act is that some people were obviously able to buy land. And how did this happen? Well, there was a kind of, there was an alternative strand of thinking um, in, you know, amongst kind of Europeans was that, you know, this kind of evolutionary ladder thing, you could, people could advance along it. So if, you know, um, Africans acted more like British people, well then, you know, they could have the same rights. They were civilized, so you could have, you could civilize people. And this was, a, this was really kind of an underlying idea for a lot of attempts in the Cape Colony especially to develop individual systems of tenure. And there's a, a reading there that I've, that I've recommended, um, which kind of also ties in with these sort of old, very early quit rent systems of tenure, which gave very strong individual rights um, and the consequence to them. So um, the problem was, you know, as I've already said, there was a, in the Transvaal a prohibition against Africans buying land. And so African communities were forced to ask missionaries and other people to buy land for them, you know, on their behalf. Um, in 1877, when the Transvaal was annexed by the British, um, Shepstone allowed land purchase through the Secretary of Native Affairs, okay, so he could also be the trustee. Of course, there's a problem with this system, um, which is, right, so how does this land purchase happen? Well, you get, um, you know, a, each household donates one head of cattle or two head of cattle or a certain amount, numbers of baskets of grain, okay? And then everyone's names get written down. Those names don't get put on the title deed, right? It's only one person's name that's on the title deed. In some cases, it was the missionary. In some cases, it was the chief. Um, well, later on, it became the chief but it was the superintendent of native affairs. So if your name is not on the title deed, you could be forgotten and um, ignored. And a lot of, and there was conflict sometimes between missionaries about this issue. Um, this picture here is uh, uh, it's on Basakang land in the 19th century. This here is Impala mine. So, you know, obviously the story of the Basakang is perhaps the most, the best example of this, of how this happens is that, you know, a lot of people contributed to buying land, but at the end of the day, it was the chief who was saying, actually, no, it's tribal land, so it belongs to me. And you have a lot of people who had contributed quite a lot, saying, no, it, I, I deserve those rights, you know, exclusive rights as well, a share of that. Um, and then this is, a, this is a kind of critical point, um, is this 1905, why am I saying 1905? Well, in 1901, um, the Registrar of Deeds would refuse to register land in the name of black people or chiefdom. So someone took this up and said, well, why? No, I want land to be registered in my own name. So on 4th of April, um, there was a Tsewu judgment, which is very famous, um, which basically upheld the right of an African man to transfer land into his own name. Um, it didn't affect existing registrations or existing, you know, land held in trust by other people, but it did um, kind of clarify a little bit of the issue of what does trusteeship actually mean? Um, you know, what, what does it involve? And after this judgment, you know, people had, could say, well, no, trusteeship in this case is a nomineeship. So basically, I have full rights. I can say what happens to this land. Um, it's just that I nominate someone else you know, I go through the this, uh, uh, Secretary of Native Affairs or I go through the missionary and tell them what to do with the land. They don't tell me what to do with the land. Um, so, that's, that, so that becomes very important. And after this judgment, um, there's a rapid expansion of land purchase by Africans. It's not because of the judgment that there's a rapid expansion of land purchase. There are lots of reasons why people started to buy more land. Um, but it is very, very important. So, sorry, I've, can I have two more minutes? Okay. Um, so there's a final thing about the mineral revolution. So we've spoken about it a little bit before, um, but there's one one more thing that I that, that I think um, 
it's partly just to be a bit provocative that I'm making this point. Um, and it's also about this issue of, you know, to what extent uh, did, you know, was the 1913 Land Act around, you know, forcing people to, to work in the mines. Um, so, you know, there are two ways, ironic, very ironic ways, because in the 20th century, min the issue of mineral rights has become incredibly disempowering and damaging and destructive to African communities. In the 19th century and the early 20th century, so up to maybe the 1920s, it was a different sort of situation. In fact, in those cases, you could almost say that the mineral revolution opened up spaces for Africans to be somewhat independent. As I say, this changes dramatically in the 20th century, but for a period. What do I mean by this? Well, firstly, we know that people went to the mines, um, uh, Peter Delius has written about this, to earn money to buy guns and, and horses. And guns and horses are what allowed the Pedi and the Zulus and other groups to defend themselves for so long. Um, and it's a shame that they couldn't keep doing so, but, you know, um, you know, the point is, is that guns and, and, and uh, things that you could accumulate through what mine wages were very important. The other thing, which is this ironic thing, is that because of the mineral revolution, because a lot of landowning companies, um, you know, which also were linked to mining companies, said, wow, we want to get this land, you know, and it's really cheap. You know, at that time, the Boers didn't understand the value of the land. So they would sell it to land companies very cheaply. Land companies would buy up huge areas of South Africa and then leave them alone. You know, they weren't interested in actually trying to make a living off of the top of the land. They were just interested in what was underneath. And it would take a long time before they managed to, you know, get the prospectors together, the surveyors, the geological people to come in and say, well, are there minerals under this ground? And in fact, in some cases, it only happened in the 1960s. Okay? So this is why on company-owned land, a lot of um, African communities were allowed, to, were able to stay there and live there for decades, um, being undisturbed by words, by white settlers, by others who were trying to come into the area and demand labor from them. So this is also why I say it's a kind of bit of a provocative thing, and this changes a lot in the 20th century, but it is to say that for a period there were these spaces where people could live independently on land for a long time without having any rights. And so that's why in the 20th century, um, it's this loss of rights in the 19th century that really kicks in. Thanks. Thank you very much.